It's a pleasure to be here today. Erev Chai Elul. Chai Elul tonight. Shabbat is going to be the birthday of the founder of Hasidism, Rabbi Israel Bar Shem Tov, and the founder of Chabad Hasidism, the Alter Rebbe. You ask, how is it possible that both their birthdays were on the same date? Everything is ordained from above. And indeed, the Baal Shem Tov was born, and when he was 37, or I'm sorry, when he was 47, at this moment, the Alter Rebbe was born on Chai Elul as well. And very interestingly, the date of Chai Elul, the 18th of Elul, has a very, very particular meaning for the Baal Shem Tov as much as for the Alter Rebbe. The Baal Shem Tov himself, the revelation he got of his teacher, Achia Sheloni, which revealed himself, was on a Chai Elul. The uh, time his teacher told him to reveal himself and to take the mantle of leadership and spread the words of Hasidut to the world was on a Chai Elul. He was born on Chai Elul. And not only that, but his... Um, his uh, student, which will eventually become a student, the Alter Rebbe, is going to be born on High Elul. So both the physical birth of the Baal Shem Tov, the spiritual birth, the spiritual revelation of the Baal Shem Tov, the birth of the Alter Rebbe, all of them coincide around this date. It must be a very important date. And this is what I want to share with you today on how we can maximize the next 24 hours of Shabbat as we celebrate and commemorate their birthdays. And what is the significance of a birthday? Why is it before Rosh Hashanah? And uh, what can we learn? But first and foremost, I would like to share with you a story. This is the story of a water carrier in the city, the holy city of Tzfat in Eretz Israel, in the Holy Land. And in the holy city of Tzfat, there was a water carrier by the name of Shraga Feivel. Shraga Feivel one day is in his house, and somebody knocks at his door. And can I speak to Shraga Feivel? He says, yes, it's me. Well, my name is Eliyahu and Avi. I'm Elijah the prophet, and I came to reveal to you when Mashiach is coming. Really. But it's at one condition. You have to tell me the mitzvah that you did the good deed that you perform on the day of your bar mitzvah. So, Shraga Feivel, the water carrier, says to him, the mitzvah that I did on my bar mitzvah is only between me and God. I'm not sharing it with you. And he forgot altogether. He, imagine forgoing the possibility to know when Mashiach is coming. As a result, when Eliyahu Navi went up to Shamaim, there was a great, great tumult. There was a great noise. And what do we do with this person that did a mitzvah for the sake of heaven and there's no price in the world, even a spiritual price, that he is ready to, a uh, spiritual prize and, and merit that he's, going, he's ready to accept to share what he did because it's only between him and Hashem. He did it only for the sake of God. What happens? They decided to send Eliyahu Navi himself to teach this person, this water carrier, Torah. From a simple water carrier, he became an illustrious sage of Torah, knowing the secrets of Torah, but externally nothing changed. He stayed the same water carrier. The same individual that continued to carry water. And that's how he was buried. He was buried as a simple water carrier of the city of Tzfat. When his soul came in heaven, at that moment there was a big question about what do we do with such a soul that did his whole life living with such a great connection with Hashem, asking for no merit, no fanfare, nobody knew about it. He did it f completely for the sake of God. So to this, it was told that this soul should come back to the world and reveal to the world the modality 
a special way of understanding things that will prepare the world for Mashiach and at the same time heal the Jews from their pain and their anguish as the Jews are suffering. That soul, my dear friends, is none other than the soul of the Holy Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. And that's why the Baal Shem Tov is the one that was ordained on high to reveal everything that has to do with Torah Ta Chassidu, the secrets of the Hasidic philosophy in order to change the way we look at the world from a negative uh, way to a positive way, to a godly way, and make that the simple people should be, the simple folk as well should understand the extraordinary connection to Hashem. Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov had a student. The student was himself a tzaddik nistar, was a secret hidden tzaddik, by the name of Baruch. Baruch and his wife, his Rebetzin, did not have any children. So they went to Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov and asked for a blessing for children. And indeed, who was born to them? Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad Hasidism. When the boy was three years old, he needed to get his hair cut this will be the only time in his lifetime that he will see the Baal Shem Tov and the Baal Shem Tov cut his hair. When the boy came back to his parents and said, No, why? Uh, who is this person that cut my hair? So they said to him, It's Saba. It's your grandfather. Indeed, the Baal Shem Tov is the spiritual grandfather of the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneur Salman of Liadi. Rabbi Baruch asked the Baal Shem Tov if he could bring his child to become the Hasid of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov did not want this. He said he will be a Hasid of my successor. But most importantly, I don't want that he should already be guided in a specific system, but rather that he should himself seek out from his own the path of Hasidut and find it on his own. And this is something very meaningful. At the age of 15, the Alter Rebbe was proficient in the whole Talmud and all of the Torah in an extraordinary way. He was brilliant. He was what we call in Hebrew an Ilui, and a genius of another level altogether. What happened? What happened is that at 15, he had a big question. Do I go to Vilna and continue studying Talmud? Or do I go to the successor of the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid of Mizrich, and learn how to pray, how to connect with God? He said, learning, studying Talmud, I think I'm pretty much aware I know, I know a little. But praying to pray, I don't know how to pray. And indeed, that's what he did. He went to the Magid of Mizrich, and he learned Hasidut, and he attached himself to the Magid, and it was something very, very, very powerful, very special. The Alter Rebbe was able to take the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov, the way it was expounded by the Magid, and bring it in practicality. We will explain soon what Hasidut is all about. But first I want to share another story with you. The Magid himself, the Magid of Mizrich, the successor of the Baal Shem Tov, the teacher of the Alter Rebbe, Himself, when he was a young man, heard about the Baal Shem Tov and decided to go check him out. He wanted to check him out. So he went and uh, he spent Shabbat, I think, with the Baal Shem Tov. And um, he was not so impressed. He himself was proficient in Kabbalah, in the different kavanot, the different intentions of prayer, and so on and so forth, and the, the Zohar, and the Talmud, etc. So he spent Shabbat there, and he didn't see something that really blew his mind with the Baal Shem Tov. So he decided to leave, just go home. But just before he left, the Baal Shem Tov sends his Gabbai to tell him, come back. Sends his assistant to call him back. 
The Magid of Mizrich comes back out of respect. The Baal Shem Tov says, you know how to study Zohar. He says, yeah, of course. Open the Zohar. Open. Read the Zohar. Read. Explain the Zohar. He explained. He says, you understood. He says, yeah, of course I understood very well. So it's pretty clear. The Baal Shem Tov decided, I'm going to read now the same piece of Zohar that you read, I'm going to read it. He reads it, and at this moment, something extraordinary out of this world happens. The moment that it says in the Zohar about the angel Michael, the angel Michael comes down. And when it talks about another spiritual level, that level reveals itself. So the Magid of Mizrich understood here that the learning there is here by the Baal Shem Tov is a completely different type of learning. It's a different type of of connection to Torah than what he experienced before. And for me, that is the key of the great novelty of what the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Liadi, brought to the world when he expounded the Tanya and Hasidut Chabad. It's one thing to learn Kabbalah, to know the names, to know the combinations, to know the pathways to heaven but it's in the book. That reality is in the book. I am I. It is it. We connect together. Am I experiencing it in my nefesh, in my soul? Maybe at a certain imaginary level, yes. But at a practical level, how does this translate into my reality in a way that these levels are speaking to me here, down here? That is the role of Hasidut. And that is the role of the Alter Rebbe with Tanya. To take the most lofty concepts and to bring them home. I'm going to give you a simple example. We know that God created the world with ten words. And we know that these ten words are actually ten channels which are called in Kabbalah the ten sfirot, the ten channels through which God created the world with wisdom, with understanding, with uh, with, uh, kindness, with severity, etc., etc. Now, if I want to understand each one of these levels, I'll explain to you, you know, chokhmah, wisdom, is the flash of understanding, it's the, 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 the a main core point. It's the image. Bina is the development. But the Alter Rebbe goes and says, you have to know that we too have ten powers inside of our souls. And these ten powers express themselves through thought, speech, and action. What are these powers? The power of wisdom, the power of understanding, the power of kindness, the power of... Oh, so now I'm going to start understanding what's above by understanding what's inside of me and how things function inside of me. When I understand that the fight there is between my animal soul and my godly soul is actually... The fight that there is between what's called Kedusha, holiness, and Klipa, and negativity in the world, I understand and look at the world in a different light. Not only do I look at the world in a different light, I understand the incredible effect, uh, the, the incredible power, and how I can affect the world by transforming myself. And suddenly I understand that I am you know, just like the mind, the brain is the microcosm of the of the the, the 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 body, so too, right? The body, it says the body, the the world, the universe is a big body, and the man is a small universe. And when I change myself, I'm changing what's happening in the world. It's not only what we see, but there's an inner dimension to everything. And therefore, what does it mean that the Alter Rebbe went to the Magid in order to learn how to pray? What does it mean to learn how to pray? Read the words! No. 
אין זו אי עבודה שבלב זו תפילה, זה תלמוד אין תענית, and it's first page, says what is the service of the heart, it is prayer. So what does prayer mean? Prayer means that it's something that I need to feel with my heart. The real prayer is not lip service. It's a service of the heart where I pour my soul out and I connect. Now you can understand that if I know nothing about God, and if I don't understand the concepts that are given to me, when I connect with God, for me, God could be this power that's waiting with a, with a stick to punish Shai each time he's going to do something wrong and is waiting, you know, for retribution. Well, that's foolishness. Hasidut explains to you how God is infinite and how God created the finite world and how he contracted and constricted his light in order for us to be able to benefit and connect to God so suddenly, when my God is a great God, you understand that the love I have for that God, the fear I have, the awe I have of God is a completely different ball game. Now I can pray. Now I can connect to Him. Now I understand, and it brings me what's called Gadfin. Gatfin in, in Aramaic means wings. I get wings. What are the wings? What wings are you talking about? So it says, Oraita belo de chilu chimulo pachale ela. Torah and prayer without the love and the fear of Hashem does not fly. Literally doesn't fly. <laughs> the famous story that when they went inside a synagogue that was full. They said, here there's no prayers. And they went to another synagogue that was empty. He says, oh, the synagogue is filled with prayers. So they asked, what are you talking about? He says, you see, when you pray, the prayer, the Torah, is like the body of a bird. The love of God is the right wing. The fear of God is the left wing. In the first synagogue, where it was full with people, people were praying with such love and fear of Hashem that the prayers were not in the synagogue. They all went up to Hashem. On the other hand, the other place where they were cold and just doing robotically whatever they're doing without any feeling, it was filled with prayers. There was no wings. It all stayed down here. You understand that the mashalim, the parable, the understanding of chasidut opens wide your mind and your heart to realize the greatness of God. And when you realize the greatness of God, you realize the greatness of what's inside of you. You realize your own power. Inside of you, you have a power of the Creator called Nitzotz bore ben Ivra, a spark of the Creator in your being. And therefore, since you have a part of the Creator in your being, ah, it's another ballgame. I can't? I can't doesn't exist. I can. I can only if I'm given the tools in Avodat Hashem and the service of God to be able to open wide and reveal that connection that I have with God. That's what Hasidut is all about. Hasidut is not about dancing in the streets. You could do that as well. And have a moment of joy where you're going to dance in the street. It's not about being a chitzon, being somebody that externally has to make a lot of movement to show its connection. It's actually a fire that's burning inside of us that's always been inside of us. And Hasidut brings it out, opens it up, and gives you another perspective altogether. 
So I'm going to share with you two stories, two parables that have to do with the month of Elul that seems to be contradicting themselves to a certain degree on what the essence of this month is. And at the same time, one of the, one of the parables is from the Baal Shem Tov, another one is from the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shiaz Zalman of Diyati. The Alter Rebbe says, Jack, during this month, the month of Elu, the 13 attributes of mercy of God are shining. What does that mean? He says, a mashali gives a parable to illustrate this. He says, the people which are in the royal city, when the king is in the field during the month of Elul, they go out to greet the king. And the king smiles at them, shows them a pleasant countenance and receives them with great joy. That is what's happening during the month of Elul. So from here I understand that the month of Elul is a month of joy. I don't understand. Before the Baal Shem Tov, before the Alter Rebbe, the month of Elul was a very uh, uh, austere month, a month where you're shaking that Koshalai is coming. And here we're telling you, no, the king is embracing you. When, what, what's happening here? This is the parable of the Alter Rebbe. The parable of the Baal Shem Tov is, what is that blowing of the shofar of Rosh Hashanah? And as well, to a certain degree, the blowing of the shofar that we blow every day of the month of Elul. And he says the following. He says, there was a king. The king had a son. This son, the prince, went away to a far, faraway cities, a faraway countries. He forgot his language. He forgot how to speak the language of home. And when he comes back, you cannot recognize that he is the prince and he doesn't know how to identify himself that, that the guards <clears throat> will let him go through. The guards will let him go into the palace to his father. He has no words. He forgot his mother tongue. What does he do? The only thing he can do in his despair is to cry out. So he starts crying the king hears the cry and recognizes the voice of his son's voice and he welcomes him. And that is the voice of the Shofar. In this way of looking at the Mashal, of looking at the parable of the Baal Shem Tov, we understand that a person went, was given certain riches and so on and so forth and lost everything, lost himself and was at the lowest level and now it's the cry of despair. That's the cry of the Shofar. That doesn't seem to make sense with the parable we said where really us going to greet the king and being greeted by the king is because we're actually, we, we, we have a closeness with the king. We have a closeness with the king which wasn't there the rest of the time, even when we were in his royal city. So how does that go? Here it seems that we're very far away from the king. So the Rebbe says, really this mashal, this parable, has to be revisited. And let me share with you this incredible way to revisit this mashal. This is from a Ma'amar, a Hasidic discourse of the Lubavitcher Rebbe from 1971. 1972, I'm sorry. The Rebbe says like this. There is a rabbi by the name of Rav Zera. Rav Zera was a great rabbi, and he was in Babylonia. And he studied the Talmud of Babylonia. But now he decided to go up to the land of Israel. In the land of Israel, we don't study the Babylonian Talmud, we study the Jerusalem Talmud. The modus operandum, 
the way, the modality, the parameters, the understanding, the way of logic of the Jerusalem Talmud is of a superior level of another level altogether. The Talmud of Babylonia has a certain way of seeing things. It's another way of operating. Just like if I told you, you know, those who are with Apple can't stand Microsoft. Those who are with Microsoft can't stand Apple. I mean, it's two separate systems, two operating systems, completely different operating systems. What did Rav Zera do? He understood, now I'm going to a new operating system. If I have any reminiscing, if I remember or still <coughs> I try to operate with the old operating system, it's not going to work. I need to forget whatever I learned before. What did he do? He fasted a hundred days in order to forget the Talmud of Babylonia, in order to now be formatted. If you remember, if you're old enough, in the olden days, you know, those who have my age, it was, used to be a floppy disk, and you would put it in the computer, and if you wanted to record something on the floppy disk, you had to format the disk. <laughs> he went through a formatting of himself, of his mind, of everything. He forgot everything. And then he was able to study the Jerusalem Talmud. Comes the Rebbe and says, this is exactly what happens to the person. The son, the king's son, went away. He forgot his language. He didn't forget his language because he went to lowly places and did lowly things and, and, and completely got drunk. No, he purposely forgot his language. He formatted his language. In order for what? To come back with a much higher language. Let's explain. You see, before we said there are words. When I don't have words because I fell so low, the only thing I have is the cry of despair. <clears throat> that cry, that voice, is lower than the words. It's deeper than the words. But then, there's another way of looking at things. There is a voice which is the source of the words. When you speak, if you don't have a voice, you can't speak the words. Words are limiting. So when I say words, it's limiting. But the voice is before the words actually are formulated. So what happens to the son of the king? The voice of the shofar, that cry, is a cry which is the voice which is beyond, above the normal language that he knew before. What language did the king's son forget? He forgot the language that he learned in the palace. What's wrong with that? And to this, I want to reconnect this to what we said at the beginning and conclude with this. The king is a father. The father gives instruction to his child. The child, till now, there was a story with the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe when, when somebody once said... Uh, Make my son for a chassid. The Rebbe Rashab said about the Friedrich Rebbe, make, make my son into a chassid. So, or chassid said to him, become a chassid, you, you need to become a chassid. He says, I'm already a chassid. The chassid told him, no, you're a chassid, you're a small chassid. What do you mean a small chassid? What does that mean? What's the difference between a small chassid and a big chassid? The small chassid, he just repeats the words that everybody else is telling him, everything he sees in the books. The real chassid is somebody that in integrated the teachings. They became his own reality, his own personal work. And when he speaks them, he speaks of his reality. He's not a parrot. That, we could say, is what happened to the, uh, to the, to the child, to the son of the king. The king's son before was speaking the royal language. <laughs> You're amongst royalty, you speak royal language. It wasn't his language. He went to forget that language in order to speak his own language. In order to be able to come to the source of his true voice. That is what Chasidut is all about. Chasidut, the teachings of Tanya, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, the teachings of the Magid, 
are there to open our eyes, to make, un- make us understand the treasures we have inside of us and connect to them, that they should become our reality. So on this very special day, as we're coming to Chayelul, I really encourage everybody to take five, ten minutes a day. Start studying Tanya. There's so many incredible, incredible classes. Baruch Hashem, which are available online. You go to Chabad.org. Go, just put Tanya classes, audio classes, uh, video classes. You, you have it. Start learning, and you're going to see how everything will be formatted. Suddenly, your experience, your encounter with the King, Hashem, on the Rosh Hashanah, will be of another level. And as you realize the greatness of your King, you will become a greater vessel to receive all of His blessings. God bless you. And good Yom Tov. I'll conclude with Misha uh, Berach for our brothers and sisters, our soldiers in Eretz Yisrael, which are doing a fantastic job. Hashem should protect them.